Hey, what's going on, everyone? Henry Kaminsky here with another Brand Doctor podcast episode for you guys. I have an amazing guest today. We connected on LinkedIn not too long ago, and he's just a fascinating individual, has accomplished so much in his life, and I knew that I needed to have him on the show. So without further ado, I want to introduce Matt Sweetwood to the show. What is going on, Matt? Oh, Henry, I am glad to be here. Now, you haven't really told everybody the truth. You know, we just were kind of sitting at a bar. We looked at each other. We saw we had the same haircut. It was an instant bonding. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And, and then the rest was history, right? That's right. It was love at first sight. Well, the good news is that when I realized where you're from, you grew up, at, you know, you're in New Jersey for 50 years, and it's very hard to find people from New Jersey when I'm when I'm online and I'm searching, you know, for great talent across the country and the world. That we find somebody literally in our backyard. Now you're in Manhattan, which is even better. That's right. But, I'm, that's right. Absolutely. I, the Jersey is like I'm a Jersey. I was Mister New Jersey. <laughs> but the state ejected me. It was actually time to go. So. <laughs> well, now you're living a life in Manhattan, which is, you know, the, yeah. the, it never sleeps. It never sleeps. You know, it's funny. When I'm in, when I was in, I, we, we live in Sparta now. It's yeah, yeah. an hour away. And when we lived 20 minutes outside of this, yeah, yeah. we never went. But now that we live an hour away, we're in there like every other week. It's insane. Yeah, as my kids got older, you know, and I started to do more stuff media-wise and so on, I, I just found myself in the city a lot more. And then eventually, you know, I saw my business. Maybe we'll talk about some of that. Kids got out of the house. I'm single. Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is going to be a great episode. Yeah. So, so I, I moved to Manhattan. It's where the business is, where the action is. You know, I've been on TV a lot. It's just a great... It's, it's a great place to be. In fact, um, I actually got featured in a New York Post article, I'd say about a year ago at this point, on uh, 50s and living it up in Manhattan. You know, people that move back in their 50s back into Manhattan. You know, because uh, so it's the I, lifestyle. It's actually very convenient. You know, having lived in New Jersey for so many years and you drive to everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, if you want, you know, a, a bottle of water, you have to drive to it. In, <laughs> in Manhattan, you either just, you know, walk down to the, you know, to literally to the middle of the block or you just have it delivered to your apartment. That's it. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the convenience has gone through the roof. But let's get into it. Uh, let's, go into, let's get into some entrepreneurship, some business. For those folks that don't know who Matt Sweetwood is, let's, let's take them back. Let's, I want to hear the stories because it's, 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 a, it's a tremendous one. So when I was born, my mom looked into the crib and said, you should be uh, an investment banker, a lawyer, accountant, a doctor, whatever any good Jewish mother would say. Uh. But, but it didn't, didn't kind of didn't go that way. You know, I had a little ADD. It was hard for me to get through school, despite the fact that I have advanced degrees. They're all kind of in mathematics and stuff. So I didn't have to read. I didn't have to do any of that. Um, but one of the things that happened is we had a family business. It was a uh, photographic supply business. It was a distribution business. We sold small stores throughout the country. That was my family business. And when I was studying mathematics, graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, I ended up um, computerizing. We had actually the, one of the first computer systems in our industry. Um, we computerized, I wrote the programs for that. And I got involved in the family business and then cut to the scene 28 years later and multiple reinventions. Our business went from a B2B business where we sold these small stores to actually a B2C business, open a camera store in New Jersey. Uh, ended up being the third largest single location store in the country. I got to exit that business because I reinvented it and a whole lot of journey along the way. So that's, <laughs> that's the best story. So with that, with all of that said, we got to look at some of the trials and tribulations that you've now being a single dad of five children. I'm I, I'm a newborn. I'm a newborn. I'm a new father of an eight month old boy. And my wife and I, uh, you know, we get up to our gills with 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 stress and anxiety. And so five and to and to 
raise them on your own. And I come from a single uh, parent family. My father raised me as well. So I can totally uh, empathize with that and feel for that. But man, how do you run a business? How do you build business? Take care of five kids, trying to build a business, trying to do uh, wear 15 different hats. How does that all come about? Okay, so that was a perfect setup for my book, which I just released 30 days ago, called Leader of the Pack. How a single dad of five led his kids, his business, and himself from disaster to success. It actually hit number one on Amazon, new release bestsellers, uh, new release self-help books. Uh, so once again, Leader of the Pack, it's where I sort of tell you how I survived all of that. The only thing that didn't make it was my hair. <laughs> I made it through completely intact. Um, no, it's, it's, I, I always say that in this world, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Uh, apparently an eight, one eight month old seems to be your limit at this moment. <laughs> but trust me, you will, I can tell you are a strong man and uh, you would rise to the occasion. You were raised by a single dad. So I know that you have soul in you from that. You know what dads go through when you do that. Um, and I think that you just somehow figure out how to manage it. Look, I, I, I've written many, many business articles. I actually have a great talk that I give on leadership where I re relate leadership as a parent to leadership in business. And I will tell you, the things you learn at home help you with business, the things you learn in business help you manage that little army of five that I had. And, you know, with some divine intervention, it all kind of turned out okay in the end. But I, it's a deep question you're asking me, how you handle it. When you have five little scared little faces looking up at you and you realize that you are it for them, mm -hmm. either you save them, you raise them, you love them, you care for them, or they're not gonna make it, it kind of shocks you into action. Mm -hmm. And you just do whatever it is that it takes. Look, I was blessed. I was able to afford to hire help, even though I went through a very, very traumatic divorce, which if anybody has been through divorce in New Jersey, mm -hmm. You can't lose any more hair, mm. so definitely can't. <laughs> New Jersey is not a very man-friendly state, even when you win five custody custody of your five children. Mm. So, you, like I said, you fight your way through it. I was lucky enough to have help at least part of the way, and um, you try hard, love your kids, be smart, and you can do it. I love it. I love it. I love your positivity. I love your attitude. I love your optimism. I mean, I, I believe mindset is a very, very strong uh, muscle, you know, to uh, constantly keep 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 tough. Because without the proper mindset, I mean, you're you're dead in the water. And I talk about this a lot. So I want to dive into some of the clientele that you work with and how you help them take whatever issues they're having and how do you help them get quicker result. Okay, so before I do that, let me just address your mindset question, mm -hmm. mindset point, because I think actually this is some of the most valuable information that we can give to people. And and, and I, I could not agree with you more, and I'm really happy that you actually mentioned it. You know, you look, there's a lot of motivational experts out there. They're the Tony Robbins and the, you know, and the, and the Gary Vanderchucks and, and the like. And, you know, that's all rah-rah kind of stuff, but ultimately, Mindset is a very, very personal, it's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, everybody goes through difficult times in their lives. And I always like to sort of distill it down to a simple principle. Your mind is like a radio. And if you tune that radio channel to anger or you tune it, tune it to negativity, if you tune it to failure, you do all of those things, which is very easy to do when you go through very tough times in your life, you will manifest and bring yourself to that level. And so as a discipline, always try to tune that radio station to positive thoughts and to positive energy. It's hard sometimes, you get down, you know, things get really, really tough. But it's that positive mindset that will give you the energy and will allow you to manifest positive things in your life. So I think, you know, you went over it quick and, and I know you talk about it and I know you've talked about it previously, but I think that that's sometimes more important than the tactics because we'll discuss tactics now and what we do. Um, but those tactics can't really be employed unless you have the right, right mindset. Mm. That. Yeah, I mean, you got to be able to accept some of the some of the, the the energy, some of the messaging, some of the 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 feeling that may be involved when it comes to developing the proper mindset. And I love the radio analogy. That is that is fantastic. 
Right. So you want to tune your, your mind. Like when I have things that happen that are difficult and I've had very, very difficult things in my mind. You know, you went through a very tough divorce. You're raising children, running a business. Anybody who's run a business. I mean, I ran a retail store and a distribu dis distribution business. Anybody who thinks that's easy. I mean, lots of stress. And you just try to tune your mind to, to you know, it's literally like a meditative kind of thing, but a more practical meditative. I'm not, I'm not saying like to sit there and zone out. I mean, meditation is great. I'm, I'm not saying anything against that. But to really focus your mind, like to block those things which are negative and focus on that. It's so important. It's so, so very important. So what did you do when there was, when there was those dark times and that the, the divorce is a tough, tough thing to bounce back from. It's a tough thing to go through. I've never gone through it, but I've gone through it as a child. And it took six years for my parents to really go get that, get, get it, get it um, fit, finalized. And so we could look at your specific situation, but my, my, my thought is how do we make it so that our audience can sort of connect with it and sort of feel what it is that you were going through and how did you overcome it? How did you get through it? Yeah, for, I, I think that this is one of the deepest questions that we face today, particularly people in middle age, you know, 50% of, of first marriages end in divorce, 60 something percent of second marriages and 70 something percentage of third marriages fail. Mm -hmm. So divorce really sits there on people. And I, co I coach people frequently. Many, many people I life coach and I, and I help them through this. And what I always tell them about divorce is the way to get through divorce and the way I eventually figured my way through it was to approach divorce like a business. So one of the things I tell people is that you should treat your spouse as you go through divorce better than you treated them when you were married to them. Mm. It's just like you have a business client that you're trying to seduce. Mm. So you can be aggressive or mean to the business client. You're less likely to get a good result than if you're nice. And it's very, very hard because these situations are very emotionalized. Mm. It seems like things are extremely unfair. But you know, I say you were born, there was never a little card placed in your crib that said life was gonna be fair. Mm. And so I always say with divorce, you treat it one step at a time, have a plan, treat it like a business, treat your spouse better than you did before, and understand the consequences of what you're doing and be prepared. You know, one of the things I always, I, that happened to me was I was very, very overweight and out of shape. I was 300 pounds one time in my life. Wow. And divorce is extremely physically demanding. So one of the ways that I actually got through it was to put myself in crazy good physical shape while I was going through the divorce. Physical strength is actually the foundation for your emotional and mental strength. If you get tired, you make mistakes. And so physical strength allows you to get through it. So to be prepared, to understand, to treat it like it's a business. It's a business that you're trying to create an outcome for. Mm. People get wrapped up in this and they get, which of course it is, it's your spouse. It's somebody you love, somebody you thought you were gonna spend your life with, someone you shared intimacy with on every level. You know, you might have children with them. In many cases you do. and that will connect you forever. And so treating it like a business becomes very, very difficult. But until you do that, you're less likely to have a successful outcome. And so the idea is to determine what you think the outcome is, consult with your attorney, research on your own, figure out what that outcome is, just like you do with a business, and try to direct the process in that way, taking steps to do that. I know it sounds very cold and calculating, but that's ultimately what you have to do. Well, if, if, if you wanna survive in business, that's something that you need to do. And this is the rabbit hole I wanna go down yes. uh, going forward with this conversation. I feel like a lot of folks are creating businesses these days for the wrong reasons. Whether they found click funnels as their savior, or they're finding these little tools and tips and tricks, or the next best thing since sliced bread is now out, and let me jump on that bandwagon. You know, I see these folks on Instagram going, it, "You don't need a product. You don't even need a service." And I'm gonna help you. How to, I'm gonna help you and teach you how to make money online, dude. Get a job. Find a skill set. Do something that's going to last. Like, you're gonna do that when you're 80 years old, 60 years old, 50 years old? Like I always, I always say the only people making money off of internet schemes are the people selling internet schemes. <laughs> and, even, and even them, even in that case, they don't make money. No. If you, if you really look at it, you find me somebody for real who's actually made a, a consistent living 
off of some scheme like that, I guarantee you, you will not be able to produce anybody. Uh, and, and, and to see somebody do it long term, not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So like, so I want to focus on outcomes and I want to help the listeners today and the watchers today, the viewers today, focus in on what, excuse me, what are, what is the importance of focusing in on the outcomes of what you want your business to produce so that they can create that desired end result that they're looking for? I think it comes down to um, how you view your business. In other words, social media, Instagram, click funnels, these are all tools. They're not actually businesses. And so your business fundamentals have to be there. The business idea, the business model actually has to be a viable one that can be maintained. It's one that you can actually run. It's one that you should be able to adapt to market conditions. If you sort of think about what I'm saying, if you apply that to, to a tool, it just doesn't make any sense even to talk about it. <laughs> and so you know you're not gonna generate, you know, and people, it's always, you know what it's like? It, I feel it's a little bit like gambling. You know, you go to a casino and there's always a bell going off someplace with somebody winning something. And then, you know, when you hear people who've been to Atlantic City or Vegas or whatever, they always talk about the time they won. You know, and, and I, when I have, I've actually done a lot of consulting. And when you dig deep into the people that really run these schemes, as you want, as I'll call them, you find that they ended up spending a lot more money and time and effort in them than they actually made, even if they have some victories along the way. And so, like you said, it's about outcomes. What do you want your business to produce? How are you actually going to make that happen? What will be the benefit to the consumer or the ultimate person buying it? How will it actually change the world? How will it improve anything? These are all questions that you need to ask. And if you don't have answers to these questions, you don't have a business. It's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I hope you're taking notes, guys, because those are some really deep questions that you should be asking yourself, whether you're in business 5, 10, 15 years, because business is constantly evolving. It's constantly innovating. I just had Fabio Viviani on from Top Chef, and he, he has 120-some restaurants across the country. And he said, if I'm not building a, a, a better mousetrap, then I'm not doing my job as an entrepreneur. I'm not doing my my family a service. You know, I'm not doing my legacy a service. And he's like, everything's been done already. It's how do you how do you take something that you're passionate about and make it better, not different, make it, make it better. You know, people get confused. They think an idea is a business. <laughs> an idea is just a very, very big, long way from an actual business. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, a, and, and I really appreciate that, that, that sort of thinking from the chef in that I, in the nineties, when this, before the internet, as I'll say, the way you would view a business as, as a good business, you would always say, if my business isn't growing, then I'm dying. You know, that would be sort of the meme if there was such a thing as a meme. So if you had a business which was flat, you that was a warning sign and business you know business advisors would always say your business is flat you need to do something you need to work on marketing growing your business you need to get it to grow that term doesn't really apply anymore because market conditions change so rapidly today mm -hmm. technology changes rapidly the tools change rapidly and so what i always say is that if you're not reinventing your business constantly you are in trouble and therefore when you start a business the business has to be such that it is reinventable as you go along, which is why one product business is, you know, you come out with the miracle hair grower. Okay. I mean, you know, that's going to have a limited shelf life because, you know, it's just kind of the way it goes out there, mm -hmm. you know, and Shamu, you can only sell so many Shamus. I have that right here. Have I dated myself? I'm probably thinking like Sham. Sh uh, Sham Wow. Sham Wow. So <laughs> I have a new product, Shamu. Right? I love it. Sham Wow. This. What can you do with Sham Wow? So Sham Wow. You go boom. You sell. You have some period of time. You go buy your house and car. Get a pretty wife. And then Shamu fails, and you get divorced. You lose everything, and you have nothing. So I don't know if that happened to the guy who made Shamu. By the way, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> like a multi-billionaire but it's just sort of the the metaphoric concept of that is that you need to have a if you're developing a business how are you going to keep reinventing and creating as you go i mean i could share you a quick example with the folks that 
may have not heard this story before, but when I started 10 and a half years ago as a graphic designer, I was a one man band and I just designed my ass off for 20 hours a day. And then when Fiverr and all these other business, you know, all these other companies came out, it commoditized the hell out of design. And I said to myself, if I'm going to be here in five years, 10 years, 50, 20, you know, if I'm going to build this legacy, this, this long-term business, I better as hell, I, I, I better find a way to reinvent, innovate, figure it out. And so I went into the branding route. I went into the consultation route. I went into the problem solving route and really started to position myself as more of a, of a brand developer, a brand strategist, a, a thinker, a critical thinker, a problem solving thinker. And what I was able to do was uh, solve bigger problems for my clients. And I just happen to have the design talent and a team now to back me to actually execute on those ideas and all of that strategy so that they didn't have to go somewhere else. Hey, listen, we've mapped out the blueprint. We got the game plan. Now let's go to phase two and let's get this all designed and built out. And I said, unless consulting goes away one of these days, which I highly doubt it will because it's a, it's a billion dollar business, right? I'll be okay. But it was a lot of transitioning. It was scary as hell. Like when I told all my clients that I wasn't designing their club flyers anymore, that was a steady stream of business for a very long time. And I was nervous as hell to say, listen, I have to focus my energies and time and energy on other things because I know I'm not going to be 50 years old designing club flyers for people. So it was scary, but reinvention was the way to go. So. I mean, you, you reinvented yourself. And I think the um, example that you uh, illustrate there is an extremely important lesson. And the lesson is you actually reinvented yourself while you were still working, which is the hardest thing to do. <laughs> now, I will tell you, I came from the photo industry. The photo industry is littered with companies who were at the peak, the peak of business, were monolithic, gigantic, top Fortune 10 companies, that were unable to reinvent themselves. Let me give you some examples because these are very, very relevant to people who run themselves today. We can talk about the Eastman Kodak Company. So if you have listeners out there who are probably under 35 years old, might not even know who the Eastman Kodak Company is. But just as an example, the Eastman Kodak Company invented the digital camera. Invented, invented it. it. It sat there, their board decided they were making too much money on film. Film was a cash cow, and they were just not going to divert resources or marketing or take the company in a different direction. Kodak now is some silly little licensing company. I'm sorry, Kodak, I actually know the guys over there. They're, they still do some significant things in printing and so on, but they're not a Fortune 10 company, they're a licensing company, and they lost the photographic market. I'll tell you another story. I actually know people who are in the boardroom at Sony, right? Sony is still a successful company today. They were in the boardroom. At one time, Sony had about 70% of the video market. Their tech team presented to their chairman the concept of a small point of view camera and said that we should market it. They rejected the idea and continued to produce camcorders. Five years later, GoPro owned 70% of the video market with a point of view camera from nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I can continue to go on about companies that- Toys R Us. Themselves. When the car is moving, it's very, very hard to make changes on the engine, but with the art of learning how to do that will make you successful. I always say Apple is making a mistake. I just saw actually a graph that shows that 70 or 80% of their revenue comes from iPhone. How many people believe that 10 years from now, we're still going to be walking around with these big, thick, blocky devices? How many people think that? I saw actually a technology which is going to project the phone on your arm. It's like a little watch, you know, like one of these smart watches, and it projects the phone on your arm so that you don't have to carry it <laughs> perfectly on your arm. Of course, I have a hairy arm, so I'm not sure how that works. But anyway, the point I'm making is that no technology is safe. And I would tell Apple right now, you need to have, you should be taking that company in a different direction right now. Mm. 
So See, these are all. If you, a, if you have a startup, you're an individual, a solopreneur, always be looking for new business, new ways to create business and new directions to take yourself. Oh, I love it. I mean, I, I tried to, there's a new app that, that Fabio Viviani came out with called Doppel. You should definitely check it out. It'd be, it'd be, it would be phenomenal for you. It's a, it's a platform. It's a Q and a platform app. And it's, it's really cool because you get to ask questions to celebrities. You get to ask questions to, you know, influencers and, 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 and people that are experts in their field and they, uh, respond with a up to a two minute video response, right? So it's, it's very personable. It's very uh, unique. It actually saves you time as an, as an influencer or an expert where if you get the same question 50 times, you could say, go to my doppel, right? And, and look at some of the questions there. The question may be asked three or four different va variations, right? But the answers are there. So it's a marketing, it's a great platform for an expert. Uh, consultant, an expert in their industry to really showcase their expertise. I'm looking at it right now. You yeah. always that, right? So yeah, Doppel app, D-O-P-P-L-E app.com, app.com. It's a phenomenal platform and it's going to do amazing things in the future. I was in the beta test and I was getting my feet wet with it and, you know, Fabio and I were going back and forth and we were practicing and doing all types of stuff and it was just, I said, wait until this thing catches fire. It's going to be off the, it's going to be off the wall. The problem is, because, the problem is, is there's, we yeah. talked about this earlier. There's a lot of people out there that are claiming to be experts, claiming to do this, claiming to do that. This platform is the only platform where you can rate the response. So if you get a whole bunch of one and two star reviews, people are going to see that and be like, this guy isn't an expert. This guy's a hack, right? So. It's a great way to build expertise. And, and that's what I'm trying to stress my stress to my clients is if you don't have the proper brand identity in play, if you don't have the proper messaging, if you're not constantly being up on social media and doing these things, you're going to be out of business. That is the end result. Do you want that? And so on and so forth. So I love what you're saying. Constantly be thinking of innovating your business, innovating yourself, reinventing. I love it. You know, and one of the things you touched on there, you know, and this is a very, very important part of today's brand. It's something I give talks on all the time, which is personal branding. You know, I'm, this podcast is going to go to a lot of people, I'm sure, that that have their own businesses or thinking of starting their own businesses. And that personal branding effect, the idea of combining your brand with your company brand, being out there, connecting with people, you know, cr going on an app like that, becoming an expert in your field. I write for Entrepreneur Magazine. I've written several articles on personal branding and sort of how to go about that. I recommend people go out there. I also have an article on why startups fail. Definitely go out there and check it out, Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You can look me up, Matt Sweetwood. You'll see I've written articles on this. And that branding message is so crucial. The, the creation of networking, the creation of who you are, of establishing yourself as a thought leader is fundamental really to any business. Any business, particularly for people running small businesses, a solopreneur, as I like to call them, entrepreneurs or whatever, is having that personal, that strong, visible, powerful personal brand and one that establishes you as a thought reader is gonna lead you to success and connect you with people and ideas that will help lead you to success. I get this question a lot, man, and I would love to have you kind of shed some light on it and as we turn the corner and sort of wrap up a little bit. A lot of people ask, where do you get started when it comes to building your brand? Like, where do you, and I, I feel like you're going to come back to that, that topic of conversation we had earlier about what is the, what is the desired outcome you want for your business? But I want to hear from, from, from you, your perspective, where does one start when it comes to creating that personal brand? Um, okay. So this is a very, very simple concept. And that is you get out there and you start talking about it. And success in talking about it will actually lead you to the right place. So for example, when you go out there and you build a personal brand, you start to talk about things which are personal to you, things that are business related, things that are of interest to you. As you start to see your audience react to those things that you talk about, you will know what will be successful. The biggest thing that I face when I give talks on personal branding is people go, I don't know where to begin. I'm afraid to post. I'm afraid to talk about things. People won't like it. Well, I'm like, don't worry, you'll fail fast. <laughs> if you start posting pictures of your product attached to cats, 
you're going to fail fast. <laughs> and so you'll teach you very quickly that that probably is not how you want to take your brand. And so you start to talk about things. I did that when I started to write my started to write my book, my leader of the pack book. Oh, wait, I have a copy. I, I need to show it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Leader of the pack book. Love the cover. I know the guy is just like wait. That's really good. <laughs> This guy's offensive. Oh, for those of you guys that are listening to the podcast, you have to go watch this video when it's produced. We'll okay. Like, oh my God. Uh, you know, so when I started to do that, look at, think about what my personal brand was going to be about single fatherhood, writing about actually abuse, abuse by men, uh, uh, by, by abuse of men by women. Think of the sensitivity of that topic today. Think of single parenthood. Think of talking about divorce. And I'm some bald ass Tony Soprano lookalike from New Jersey. <laughs> and so when I go out and start to establish this personal brand, I can come across as being very angry, as being a woman hater, a misogynist, somebody who is bitter, you know, all of these things. And so when you go out there and you start to approach your audience with ideas, it's how they react to those ideas that lead your way. And from there, I found my voice. I was in the photography business, so I started to figure out how to talk about my business in a way that was successful. I ran a retail store, a camera store. So if I would go out there and say, hey, this this Lumix camera is $1,000, come buy it. Nobody would care. But if I went out there and I said, hey, you know, I just spoke to the vice president at Panasonic, and he told me that the new Lumix camera coming out that we're carrying today does the following and nobody knows about it, people get interested. Hmm. So it's that nuance of how you present your brand and how you talk about things that you learn just simply by trial and error. So the way to start building a personal brand is to just do it. Go out there, start talking about things that are interesting. Start talking about things that are relevant to you personally or about your brand or about your business. See the audience reaction. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, whatever. Whatever tool that you want to use, get out there, blog, write about things, talk about things and you'll get an audience reaction and then listen to that audience reaction, even if it's just two people to start with, and then start to try to draw more people into you by changing the way you approach. So that's the way I would go about a personal brand, just start, just do it, start talking, adapt, and quit, and just keep posting and keep talking and keep working at it and working at it, and you will eventually figure out the messaging that, draw, that draws people in. Oh, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. So I have one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Where do you think people, entrepreneurs, business owners, where do where are they going wrong today when it comes to growing their brand and building their business? I think it has something to do with what you spoke about previously, where there is so much internet availability of techniques and tools they lose sight of actually what they're trying to accomplish and the messaging they're trying to get across. And so it's very easy to go buy a tool or go buy followers or go buy something that you think will help your business without actually having a strategic plan to do it and hoping the tool will solve the problem. And so we end up spending our resources and time instead of putting the work in to develop business. And in many cases, businesses develop one customer at a time one relationship at a time, one decision at a time. Oh, I love it, Matt. That was, that was gold right there. I, wow. What a tremendous jam packed episode, 38 minutes long. And we tackled, <laughs> we tackled mountains. mountains. We, didn't talk, we didn't talk about dating in Manhattan yet. <laughs> That's, that's the episode I'm going to have you come back for, for sure. <laughs> Matt, where can people find you? Okay, it's I am so easy to find. M Sweetwood everywhere. Msweetwood.com at M Sweetwood on Twitter. I promise if you tweet at me, Facebook at me, email me, write me, do anything, I will get back to you. And of course, you need to go out, go to Amazon, leader of the pack. There we can see it right there. How a single dad of five led his kids, his business, and himself from disaster to success. It was a number one bestseller, self-help books. Um, I have a hundred and something five-star reviews. You can see the book has changed people's lives. So that's how you get it. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Matt, I appreciate the relationship. I appreciate you reaching out to me on LinkedIn and, and, and becoming part of the show. 
and just getting to know you today was just tremendous. You dropped a lot of value here and it's not only helping me, but it's helping my audience and our viewers to really take their business and, and brand to the next level, to ask those tough questions, ask those deeper questions, uh, and really determine the outcome that they want prior to making that next move. And that's going to help you tremendously just get to where you want to be a hell of a lot faster. So Matt, thanks again for coming on the show. Henry, it was a pleasure. I really like the depth of what we talked about. Nothing surface, really, you know, digging deep into the into the depths of, you know, really what turn what determines success. Well, Thanks for having me. well that, you're welcome. And, you know, that's 99% of the people out there. They just go surface level with this stuff. And, and, and I'm hell bent on taking it to where people don't want to take it because that's what's going to separate us, Matt, from all the other nonsense that's out there. And uh, that's what I will continue to do. So real quick, some housekeeping stuff. As usual, if you haven't shared this podcast with a friend or a colleague yet or haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. And I appreciate it. Thank you in advance for that. If you could take a quick second, if you love this value, if you love the podcast and love the value that we're creating here, drop a quick little written review for us. That will help me tremendously stoke the fire, keep me motivated, keep me focused and keep bringing you tremendous value to help you take your business and brand to the next level. So there you have it guys, another episode in the books. I will catch you on the next show. Take care.